rich man must do his best. Welcome to another edition of The Public Interest. My name is David Granger. And on this series of programs, we examine issues of public interest to Guyanese at home and in the diaspora. And we dealt before with the topic of death, um, maternal deaths. And uh, on this occasion, we'll be dealing with the question of infant deaths. Um, in fact, you may turn the coin around. And in reality, we're talking about saving lives. Um, too many persons are, are dead on arrival. They are dead on the day of their birth. And this is a big problem for um, not only Guyana, for other countries around the world. In fact, one million children die on the day they are born every year around the world. And another one and a half million are unable to survive past the first five months, according to a UNICEF report. And you can imagine what is happening now in um, places like um, Gaza, where um, it is clear that many children are, are being killed. And um, it, it certainly will affect pregnant women who are out to deliver children. But this is a frightening statistic. And uh, Guyana has made a contribution uh, to this uh, grisly toll of deaths. In fact, um, on the 1st of February, uh, the uh, Georgetown Public Hospital Corporation announced the death of a baby due to complications uh, during delivery. And uh, the next month, the hospital announced the death of an, a premature baby. Um, so we are not out of the woods in terms of dead on arrival, children who, were, who died on the day of their delivery. Every year, every year, infants die of complications in the pregnancy of their mothers, childbirth or postpartum period, and some of them are preventable. Infants die from suffocation, from drowning, and by accident um, before their first birthday. When we speak of infant death, it's, it's different from what is called neonat uh, neonatal mortality. Infant mortality is uh, slightly different. Thing, but when we speak of infant death, we speak about the deaths of an infant before her first birthday. This is according to the centers for disease control and prevention. Neonatal mortality refers to the death of a baby. This is not a lecture on gynecology or anything, please. I'm a layman, I'm just trying to interpret the data. Neonatal mortality refers to the death of a baby before the age of 28 days. And what we find is that around the world, children under the age of one constitute 5.2% of all deaths. Guyana does not have a pretty record. In 2016, there were nine deaths of, of children who, were, who died on the day of their birth. In 2017, there were seven deaths. In 2020, there were six deaths. So you can see the direction of mortality under the APNU-AFC coalition. Unfortunately, um, in 2021, we were still at six deaths, but by 2022, we were up to 10 deaths. And I hope that the figures this year, 2023, indicate that we are making improvements. Nobody wants to see um, backward steps in the matter of childhood or infant deaths. Uh, when we think of infant deaths, um, we are looking at causation. Why do infants have to die? I mean, you can imagine the, where a mother feels uh, after bearing um, an unborn child for nine months, only to find on the day of delivery that rather than life, she is faced with death. And I think even fathers, any father who has ever held um, a newborn babe in his arms, much as a mother, or any parents who have held a newborn baby would know 
how precious life is. But there are a number of factors um, responsible for infant deaths. And many of them relate to poverty and malnourishment. And at a glance, you can say, well, we can deal with both, you know, poverty and malnourishment. I have isolated 10 factors or 10 causes, and perhaps there are more, and perhaps if you spoke to a professional uh, medical personnel, midwives, doctors, and nurses, they could tell you, you know, other causes. One of the main causes is anemic mothers. Uh, carrying a baby for nine months takes a toll on a woman's body, and she needs to be well nourished before, during, and after. And anemic mothers is, um, is a factor that normally contributes to um, uh, deaths. Another factor is bacterial infection. That is why we need sanitary and hygienic conditions um, for delivering children and and of course, bringing them up. Then you need to consider also the mental and physical condition that affect the health of the mother. Um, uh, not only during pregnancy, but also postpartum. And um, they affect her condition and her baby's condition. Another factor is preterm birth. When a baby is born before 37 weeks of pregnancy. Um, and preterm birth could sometimes have complications. I won't go into those now, but um, another factor is home deliveries. This used to be very popular, it used to be standard. I was delivered at home by my mother's uh, godmother, who was a midwife, and my mother, of course, was a nurse. Um, but nowadays, um, some home deliveries could be problematic. Um, for various reasons, um, many of them you know, medical, technical, or sanitary. Uh, another factor could be respiratory distress, and that is why very frequently in maternity ward you see respirators, because breathing um, is important. You want to know why a midwife or a nurse or a doctor will give a newborn baby a slap to maybe to generate that first push for oxygen for air um, to make sure that the baby can breathe. And respiratory distress is, is a factor which uh, could contribute to, to death. Uh, and then there's a, a, a little investigated condition known as SDS, or sudden death syndrome, and there could be a variety of causes, not one cause, in, in which sometimes you may think a baby is coming along well, but then there's sudden death. Um, and then there's a question about the weight babies, which sometimes could relate to the, the nutrition of the mother. Because this is a baby, and um, if, if it's born on the weight, it's born at a disadvantage. That baby girl is born at a disadvantage. Then you could have unintended injury, um, sometimes by suffocation, um, because babies might be lying down close to the mother, the mother may roll over. Or sometimes the baby gets smothered in a sheet or a blanket or a pillow and gets suffocated unintentionally, unintentionally. And uh, the tenth factor that I would mention, as I said, a professional could probably give you better advice. And um, sometimes the conditions under which a child is, is brought up could be unsanitary. And... Uh, again, that may mean that the child is susceptible to, to infection. Um, you know, it, it may be, again, unintended or involuntary. People may be spraying the area with, with some um, fogging to destroy mosquitoes. And uh, sometimes the baby could be uh, left in a place which is dirty or maybe fed with uh, with the person with dirty fingers and dirty hands and dirty bottles. But once a baby is exposed to those unsanitary conditions, he or she could be infected and could be harmful to the baby's life. So 
the causation, you know, is is important that a mother or a family or a father must be aware of these factors and ensure that no harm comes to the baby, either um, through deliberate action or failure to take action. And this is something which is a contributory factor to, um, to deaths, um, particularly infant deaths. Uh, infant deaths, like maternal deaths, could be aggravated by social, cultural, and economic factors. For example, I have mentioned frequently in, in uh, rural areas or hinterland areas, uh, villages may be far apart, uh, settlements may be far apart, and uh, you know the low population density could mean that uh, a mother or a family could live some distance away uh, from another family or even from a hospital or some governmental institution. So the demographic factor is important because Guyana has a very low uh, population density of just uh, sometimes, you know, maybe 3.5 persons per square kilometer in some parts of the hinterland. Um, so the geographical factor combined with the demographic factor could militate against getting a mother to hospital on time. Then there's gender inequality. And the fact is that um, sometimes women's complaints are not understood or appreciated by men. Um, and uh, sometimes a woman may make a complaint or um, she's treated in, in a very unequal manner. Um, and uh, I suppose people who have experience in this field will tell you about um, the difficulty in, in getting children, uh, women in difficult circumstances to hospital in time. And my own experience is that um, even in Rupununi, some women had to be taken, you know, by ATV from their village to let them and from let them to um, Bonfi or Bo Vista. Uh, and by the time the woman gets there, she's lost a lot of blood and uh, sometimes she's lost the baby. So we should not ignore these factors, the demographic factors, geographic factors, and and gender factors, um, in which sometimes the women are not treated with the um, attention they deserve. And then, of course, you have the problem of poverty. People just can't afford to get there on time. And as a result of that poverty, um, you may find that there is a death. A woman may die, or sometimes a baby may die. A big factor, too, is the Unavailability, unavailability of skilled personnel, doctors, midwives, and nurses. And we have to be careful here because we're losing nurses, as I pointed out. Um, we're losing about 18 nurses every month. I don't know if the figure has changed um, since 2022. 18 trained nurses have been leaving the public health service. And it is unsustainable. And you know, authorities have spoken about bringing in nurses um, from foreign countries. Well, that's not a solution. That is, you can't continue relying on Chinese medical brigades and Cuban med medical brigades. We are an independent nation now, and we have to solve these problems by speaking to the uh, persons concerned with the um, representation of the nurses. That is the solution. Uh, no Chinese medical brigade, no Cuban medical brigade can solve the problems of the shortage of nurses and doctors in Guyana. And that is my view. And if your system, your public health system is losing 18 nurses every month, something cannot be right there. Something cannot be right. And you must deal with the problem, you must avoid the problem um, of, of, that is affecting the nurses. We must speak to the nurses and the representatives of the nurses um, so that we can solve the problems. It is, it is a national shame when uh, babies' chances of survival are determined by the place they live in the country geographically, which region they live, or 
by the economic status, whether they're poor or well-to-do. And every Guyanese woman must have access to life-saving health services. Rich or poor, uh, hinterland or coastland, village or town, every Guyanese woman must have access to uh, life-saving health services, particularly those about to give birth or those who have just given birth. My friends, we can look now at the question of prevention and of reduction of infant deaths. I mentioned some of the factors, but in my view, an important objective should be to avoid situations, and this is very important, in which children are giving birth to children. <laughs> it's very important, you know. That word is not um, some, some fad, you know, some, you know, some sideshow. It is, it is central to the way the country develops. And when you have children giving birth to children, uh, it means the mother, the mother's body may not be capable and the mother's got to drop out of school. It means the family is not prepared for the entry of that new life. And there are other factors which you know um, from your own experience better than I do. But when children are giving birth to children, um, when I talk of children, I mean girl children, you know, teenagers, 12, 13, 14 year old girls, and we, we know this has happened. I'm not going to go into that in this program. But we need to take several measures to prevent or reduce infant deaths. And I start by saying we do not need a, a culture, we do not need a society in which children are giving birth to children. Childbearing is for women. <laughs> And regardless of what the law says, you become a woman after you're 20 or 21. Now, it is my view that infant deaths could be reduced. Again, I come back to the issue of preventing unwanted and too early pregnancies. The girl child may not be mature enough, either in mind or body, to look after herself and the baby. A child is a child. And uh, children don't have any business delivering children. Girls need to be educated to understand the preventive measures they need to adopt. All women, including adolescents, including pre-adults, need to have access to contraceptive methods which can reduce maternal deaths. At least by 30%. This is, this is what I think PAHO recommends. That once they are aware of these methods, um, you know, what you call, you know, um, premature or unplanned pregnancies could be reduced. Maternal deaths could be reduced as well. Um, secondly, infant deaths could be reduced by, um, or have been reduced by an important PAHO WHO program, which was adopted um, during the APNU AFC coalition administration. It was called Helping Babies Breathe. You see the importance of breathing? Um, from, from the first minutes of the baby's life, this initiative tried to build, or did achieve in building the capacity of nurses and other healthcare workers uh, to provide quality care to newborn babies. It's called the Helping Babies Breathe Initiative. Deaths began to be reduced. It was uh, an expensive program by those standards. Nowadays, money is flowing um, at a greater rate, a greater volume. It cost 1.6 billion Ghana dollars then in 2016. And the government combined with the Inter-American Development Bank. And they were successful in reducing maternal perinatal and neonatal deaths. Um, that is seven years ago. Um, that initiative, the Helping Babies Breathe initiative, and we need more of those initiatives. We need further support from Inter-American Development Bank. And um, we need a government which thinks about uh, you know, the health of mothers. 
It helped to improve the quality of care in about 140 health facilities around the country and it impacted 140,000 women and 9,000 babies annually. So it was a successful program and it needs to be continued. I think sometimes when governments change, you know, um, it, is, it is typical um, or conventional and it's quite unfortunate to throw the programs out of the window um, and uh, say how bad the previous government was. And the problem is that um, people end up making the same mistake the previous government made. Although the previous government did rectify some of those errors and mistakes, it happened with the infectious disease hospital. As soon as the new government came in, they criticized the hospital. And then when they realized that COVID was, was not going away, they, they, they tried to um, um, improve the quality of the service in that hospital. But that is what governments do. And the time we grew up as a nation and stopped criticizing the previous administration, improve on what the previous administration did, but in a manner in the matter of, of child of children's deaths, infant mortality, we need to keep the programs going from regime to regime. No government lives forever, and it's something that we must learn. What is the way forward, my friends? Uh, we can reduce uh, infant deaths significantly. This year, for the first time, we have an $85 billion budget for the public health service. This is remarkable. Yes, um, we are a petroleum, petroleum country, and this sector has been a beneficiary of a significant augmentation of the public health budget. But secondly, um, in addition to the money, we need a plan. And that plan, in my view, must be a primary health care plan that provides for every woman and child um, the care that they need. Primary health care, I'm talking about, I'm not talking about specialty hospitals, I'm not talking about, um, you know, medical tourism or, you know, bringing in people just to get some uh, operation from overseas. They're talking about primary health. And that is the basis of the plan in my view and the third factor is political will we must have a political administration that is committed to um, primary health care um, and this deals with individual citizens um, particularly in this case for women during pregnancy and, and of course after pregnancy so i will leave this with you one Primary health care, PHC, must be state policy. It is not a notion, it is not a fad of this party or that party. It must be state policy. It is essential to improve the conditions and enhance the commitment of primary care. The doctors, the whole system, the whole medical service, the whole public health service must be committed to primary care. Unless we get that right, we'll always have problems downstream. Emphasis must be placed on professional midwives who can help to reduce maternal and neonatal mortality. Midwives, yes, midwives, once they're well-trained and certified, could provide about 80% of the essential maternal care and it could avert maybe 40% of the maternal death. This is PAHO. PAHO, this is the Pan-American Health Organization. Once we have a core of trained, competent midwives, we could save about 40% of maternal deaths and of course, um, infant deaths as well. Second requirement is that there should be a maternal health service. We have to take maternal health seriously. It is not a side show. It is not an extra to other forms of medical treatment and other diseases. Maternal health is central. And in my view, it rests on five pillars. One is that it is based on the employment of professional personnel, people who are available, who are certified and equipped, and people who are respectful 
of the rights and needs of expectant mothers. That is, is not just a question of courtesy. Nurses and midwives must respect the rights and needs of expectant mothers. Second, there must be the second pillar of a maternal health service is the execution of public policies related to access to universal coverage in maternal and sexual reproductive health. Um, that is, there must be an authority which executes public policies um, consistently in relation to universal coverage. Every woman must be part of that universal coverage, maternal and sexual health, sexual and reproductive health. Third, I come back to uh, uh, one of the purposes of this program, public interest. That is that at the village level, at the neighborhood level, NDC level, that is why the local government system is so important. Um, it is not an unnecessary aspect of, of, of government that could be overruled by central administration. The NDC, the village level, uh, must see the establishment and improvement of village maternal clinics. In Guyana, where you have over 200 Amerindian villages, over 100 African villages, maybe not 100 Indian villages, um, although they don't call themselves African or Indian or indigenous villages. We know that the majority of the population are people, women who live in villages, not in towns, they live in villages. So your primary health care policy, your PHC policy must be based on villages where the majority of women live. And that is where we want to see um, the establishment of, of clinics and centers and the improvement of those clinics and centers. And we want to see, fourthly, the expansion of maternity wards in the hinterland regional capital towns. Again, coming back to the APN UAFC coalition, um, you would recall that our coalition administration established four new towns in the hinterland where there were none before. They were just NDCs, they were just villages. We now have towns in Bartica, Mabrum, Madi, and Lethem. And the regional hospital, something, anything called a regional hospital, must have a very strong maternal ward. And of course, when I visited the regional hospital at, at Region 7 at, at Bartica, um, the, town, the capital town of Bartica, you know, um, my wife and I were able to go into the maternal ward there. And every regional center, every regional hospital must have a, a well equipped um, sanitary maternal ward. And um, in addition to that, um, the expansion improvement, we would like to see maternity hospitals, hospitals dedicated just to helping mothers, uh, expectant mothers to give birth um, to the children. You want to see health centers, you want to see clinics in rural coastland and hinterland villages. We want to stop having women traveling distances in discomfort to get to um, centers where they could deliver their babies seriously. And finally, education and information. There must be public information campaigns which could be targeted towards women in order to reduce maternal morbidity and mortality. And we should use the new technologies you know, tracking devices and portals so that pregnant women records are digitized. Um, you must get away from cards and paper and make sure that they're digital records. And uh, we should try to improve the quality of maternal and sexual reproductive health care, reduce mortality and ensure women's right to health. So these are some of the measures um, which we could introduce uh, maybe some of them are already working. I'm not uh, saying that they're not, but there must be a primary health care policy. There must be a, a, a dedicated maternal health service, and there must be maternal education and information. My friends, we are Guyanese. 
we are concerned not with criticism of the past, but, but with recommendations for the future. The state of Guyana, then, this cooperative republic of Guyana in which we live, and which some of us will never leave, has a duty to ensure that pregnant women everywhere, no matter where they live in this country, no matter what their economic or social status, every mother, every woman should be able to rely on a sturdy maternal health service based on primary health care policy so that they could give birth to their babies the healthiest, or they can give the babies the healthiest safest start in life in this land of their birth, the healthiest and safest start in life in this land of their birth. We look forward to a bright future for mothers and babies in Guyana. Thank you and may God bless you all. Each man must do his